Hola, ¿cómo estás? Espero que estés súper bien. This is Tamara Marie, host of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. Now, before we jump into this episode, I wanted to let you know about a special opportunity that you're definitely going to want to take advantage of, especially if your goal is to become fluent in Spanish. For a limited time only, my team is opening the doors to listeners of the podcast to take advantage of a free language coaching session. Now, in this session, it's not just we're teaching you about verbs or grammar, but we're really going to do a deep dive into what are your goals for learning Spanish, assess where you are on your journey to fluency at the moment, and help you map out a 90-day plan for how you can get to fluency. So we are going to help you take your Spanish to the next level, whether you're afraid of speaking Spanish or you just get a little bit nervous when you're talking to native speakers, or maybe you've got some of the basics down, but you really know that you struggle with getting your Spanish to flow and your listening skills aren't up to par. Whatever it is, even if it is a specific grammar issue, we will help you map out how to tackle that. And normally these sessions do cost, so we are offering a few slots for free. There are limited spaces available and they'll only be open up through the end of the month. So make sure you sign up. Go to SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach. That's SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach to book your free language coaching session where we will help you map out a 90-day plan to get to Spanish fluency. Okay, let's get started with the episode. This episode of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast is brought to you by Yabla. Yabla provides language immersion through engaging videos for Spanish, English, Italian, French, German, and Chinese language learners. Yabla features authentic content by native speakers, custom playback, subtitles, learning games, and flashcards. Yabla is the premier language learning video platform with tools to enhance conversational understanding, such as the patented dictation game Scribe. Now, if you haven't tried out Scribe, I definitely recommend you check it out. It is a game changer when it comes to improving your listening comprehension, and it's the perfect way to practice active listening. Stream authentic shows and music you enjoy while you learn at the same time. Give Yabla a try today using this special link yabla.com slash salsa that's y-a-b-l-a dot com forward slash salsa bienvenidos welcome to the learn spanish con salsa podcast the show for spanish learners that love music travel and culture Close your grammar textbooks, shut down the language apps, and open your ears to how Spanish is spoken in the real world. Let us show you how to go from beginner to bilingual. Here is your host, certified language coach, Tamara Mari. Hola y bienvenidos al episodio 42. Welcome to episode 42 of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. In this episode, I'm going to talk all about one of the most common questions I get asked, and that is, what type of Spanish should I learn? Uh, Now, many people will tell you that Spanish is just Spanish, that it's a very easy language to learn, uh, you can pick it up fairly quickly, and that really it's there's not much difference in Spanish um, spoken in different countries, so you should be fine if you learn what they call quote unquote neutral Spanish. Now Spanish is really a diverse language. It's spoken in countries from Europe to South America and even in the Caribbean. Some people will argue that Spanish is Spanish no matter where it's spoken and it really doesn't matter what type of Spanish you learn. Now I'd have to say I respectfully disagree with this opinion. When you are learning a language, you are not just learning about grammar and vocabulary, Language is just one component of a broader culture. So that means to truly learn a language, you have to learn about the culture of the people that speak the language. The diversity of the Spanish speaking population makes the language itself just as diverse. And having a basic understanding of these cultural influences is almost just as important as mastering complex grammar concepts. So what do I mean when I say what type of Spanish should you learn? Most people think of this as dialects. While there are several regional differences in the Spanish language, selecting a type of Spanish is a little bit more targeted. So the two most important factors or characteristics to consider when you're identifying a type of Spanish 
are the country or region in which it's spoken and also the context. So first, the country or region. Now, this is the one that we probably most often think about when we think about a type of Spanish. I think people broadly think about it in terms of, you know, should I learn Spanish from Spain, which sometimes is called Castilian uh, Spanish, or should I learn Latin American Spanish, right? Which to me is almost a false categorization because Latin America is very large and it includes many different countries. And Spain is just one country. So really comparing this one country to the rest of the entire Spanish speaking world almost is really not a fair comparison. And I don't think it's a real choice. Um, if you are in Europe, then it is very clear that you will probably be more exposed to Spanish from Spain. Uh, but there are plenty of other countries where Spanish is the official language. Um, and there are some significant differences between those countries. So the first thing you will want to consider is the region. And I would humbly suggest that you narrow it down a little bit more than just Latin America. Uh, so you can even uh, choose a region. Like if you want to choose Mexico, uh, Mexico is big enough that you can really choose that as a, a, a focus. Um, you can choose the Caribbean, which includes uh, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, which we talk about a lot on this podcast. We focus a lot on Spanish spoken in the Caribbean. Uh, you have Central America um, and then even in South America I would say regions um, further south like Chile, Argentina, Uruguay like those are going to be a, a little bit different than the Spanish that you might find spoken in the northern part of South America such as in Colombia or Venezuela. So give that some thought think about the country or region that you want to target. Uh, the reason for this is that each Spanish-speaking country and region has unique words, vocabulary, culture, and a history, and all of those things influence the language that's spoken. Almost every Spanish-speaking country, including Spain, also has speakers of other languages. So I'm not referring to foreigners that move into a country, but natives of those countries that speak other indigenous languages that have mixed in with the Spanish that is spoken in those places. So that is a huge influence. The other languages that are spoken uh, in that country or region um, really do influence uh, the Spanish spoken there, including English, which you'll find a lot of Spanglish, as I call it, depending on uh, what country you're in and the influence that uh, either the U.S., or, or Britain has had most often the US on those cultures. So this is why there are wildly different and unrelated words for some things between different countries and regions. So not being aware of this fact, even if you're a beginner, is really a huge mistake. I would have saved myself and others so much confusion had I understood early on that it's important to focus on a specific type of Spanish. Now, the second factor to consider when you're looking at a type of Spanish is the context in which the language is used. Now, this includes the environment, circumstances, or conditions that surround your use of the language. So, for example, if you're learning Spanish for work and you plan to be attending meetings and giving presentations, then you may need to focus on formal Spanish and Spanish for your particular profession. Now, if you want to communicate with extended family and friends, then you'll need to learn Spanish in a more informal or conversational style. So putting all of that together, to clearly define what type of Spanish you want to learn, you must consider both characteristics, both the region or the country and the context. For example, if you decide you want to learn business Spanish, it's important to identify the countries you'll be working with. And this is because conducting business with someone from Mexico versus Spain or Argentina even can have some different cultural implications that you'll want to be aware of when you are in a more professional setting. Now, even if you decide, hey, I just want to learn Mexican Spanish, well, you still have to pay attention to the context. Do you just want to make new friends in Mexico and visit often for vacation? Or is it a place that you're looking to retire, right? Because those will be different sets of vocabulary and considerations that you may need uh, depending upon what your plans are. Okay, so the answers to these questions will really dictate where to focus your study. So here are some examples of types of Spanish. You could learn European Spanish for travelers, and that's if you're planning to take a trip to Spain, for example. You could learn Latin American Spanish for medical professionals. You could learn business Spanish for Argentina. You could learn Cuban Spanish for social workers or Caribbean Spanish for salsa dancers or even conversational Dominican Spanish. 
So as you can see, these are a little bit more specific and more narrowly defined than what you might be used to. And depending on what type of Spanish you're learning, it may be more or less difficult to find resources that you need to focus on your particular type of Spanish. Now I'll provide some more details on how you can look for study materials a little bit uh, later in the podcast. Um, and I know this might seem a little bit tedious and you still might be thinking, well, look, Spanish is still just Spanish. Uh, but before you get ready to randomly dig into your next Duolingo lesson, <laughs> consider the following reasons why you might want to select a type of Spanish and how it can save you time and confusion. So the first reason that I would suggest you pick a type of Spanish to learn is number one, you will understand native speakers better. Now it is true that if you learn the fundamentals or the basics of Spanish, you will be able to get by understanding the language in general. Having that general understanding of how the language is used and having a grasp of a well-rounded set of vocabulary can get you pretty far. Uh, but there is one big caveat to that. You really do have to be at an intermediate or advanced level for this to be the case. And even when you reach the intermediate level, listening comprehension may still be a challenging skill to master. This is because there are differences in speech patterns, accents, and vocabulary that may still throw you off even if you've been studying Spanish for years. Uh, and a way to really prove that that's true is that even native Spanish speakers have trouble understanding Spanish spoken in different countries. Now, again, that depends on how similar the Spanish is to the Spanish they grew up with. Someone who is from one country in Central America may find it easier to understand someone else from Central America, but they may struggle a little bit more when talking to someone who is from uh, Cuba, for example. Uh, just the same as someone who is from Puerto Rico may find it much easier to have a conversation with someone from uh, Dominican Republic because they have some shared words and their accents have some similarities versus if they were to talk to someone from Argentina who has a very different types of Spanish. So again, this is something that can even trip up native Spanish speakers. So you should not expect to be proficient in every type of Spanish. It really just is not a realistic goal. Uh, and as a beginner, understanding regular conversational speed Spanish spoken by native speakers will almost certainly be a challenge no matter what type of Spanish you're learning. So think about how much easier it would be to improve your listening comprehension if you only focused on one type of Spanish to learn. Let's use English as an example. So let's say that you want to learn English and you plan to move to the United States. Now, if that was your goal, would you want to learn English from an Australian? Probably not, right? You probably know that English speakers from Australia sounds a little bit different than English speakers from the US. So this is just a very simple example, but I hope it illustrates to you that it really doesn't make sense to just blindly learn Spanish as if it's a monolithic language with no real differences. I was recently having a discussion with a friend who learned English as a second language. Now her native language is Greek, but she learned British English when she was in school. When she was a little bit older, she moved to America with a friend from Great Britain who was a native English speaker. But she explained that it took both of them over a year to be comfortable having a conversation with a US English speaker. She told me that things are just so different here in the United States that it's almost like an entirely different language. And because she didn't have much conversational practice, even learning English since grade school, it was still hard for her as an adult to understand spoken American English. So think about that for a second. Ask yourself, do you have an additional year to waste before you can have a conversation in Spanish just because you didn't think it was important to pick which type of Spanish you were learning? Probably not, right? You probably are listening to this podcast because you want to learn a little bit quicker and you want to get an edge up on other people who may be learning um, at a much slower pace. So this is one of those hacks that can really improve your progress and help you learn faster if you have this focus from the beginning. The second reason you might want to pick a type of Spanish is you will avoid confusing both yourself and others. <laughs> so let's say you just start learning Spanish and you don't really pick a type of Spanish to learn. You don't pay attention to that. And you just sort of go for whatever resources, YouTube channels, apps, whatever it is that you find. Right. And you just start learning. You could also get to a point where you start talking to different tutors and Spanish speaking friends. And you might be learning new vocabulary and writing that down as you go along. 
If you follow the all Spanish is just Spanish theory, then you might talk to them about where they're from and you just assume it's really not a big deal because you're just getting conversation practice and you're learning new vocabulary. So when you're talking to a conversation partner, you might just ask them for the meanings of words that they use that are new to you. And after a little time passes, you might feel a lot more comfortable with your Spanish conversation skills. So let's say you do that and you strike up a conversation at a friend's house armed with all the vocabulary you've been learning uh, because Spanish is just Spanish, right? <laughs> so if you blindly learn without paying any attention to the type of Spanish you're being exposed to, you may end up coming up with a weird sounding sentence like this. ¿Qué onda, May? No me gusta esa bebida. ¿Qué es esa vaina? ¿Vos podés traerme un vaso de sumo de China? <laughs> Which, if I translate that, it's like, wow, dude, I don't like this drink. What is this crap? Can you bring me a glass of orange juice? Okay, now, again, this is a silly sentence. Um, but I'm just using this as an example because it makes sense, right? If you translate it into English, you can kind of figure it out. But if you were talking to another native Spanish speaker, they would almost definitely not understand at least part of what you said. Um, you'll either sound like an international traveler or a very confused person. <laughs> so here's a breakdown of the origin of each of the phrases I use in this example. And maybe it'll help you understand why you wouldn't be understood if you were to talk this way. Okay. The first phrase I use, which is very specific to a region, is que onda, which means wow, uh, in Mexico specifically. Uh, then I said my, which is a way of saying, you know, that guy in Costa Rica. So again, this is not really used outside of Costa Rica. So if you say my to someone else, they might not know what you're talking about. Uh, then I said, no me gusta esta bebida, which is very standard. Uh, so it's like, I don't like this drink. So that would be understood by anyone in the Spanish speaking world. Uh, and then I said, que es esa vaina? Which is, uh, what is this crap? <laughs> which is, vaina is a very specific word that's used mainly in Dominican Republic. I've also heard it used in Venezuela, um, but it's not something that is common to all Spanish speakers. Um, and then I said, ¿Vos podés traerme un vaso de sumo de China? <laughs> which, which sounds really crazy. So, ¿Vos podés? is saying, can you? But I'm using boceo, which if you listen to our last episode, I talked about the five different ways to say you in Spanish, and this is one of them. Um, and if you recall from that episode, I also mentioned that bos is very commonly used in Argentina, maybe some other parts of Central and South America, but it is not um, universal to the Spanish-speaking world, and it would sound a little bit odd um, if you just said vos podés. And so I say vos podés traerme un vaso de sumo de china okay so vaso is a glass right that's pretty standard uh sumo means juice but it's really only used in spain um in most of latin america to say juice you would say jugo um, and again some people might be familiar with this uh but don't assume that everyone that speaks spanish is an international traveler so just because there are different ways to say something everyone might not know what all of those ways are so Sumo, again, is very specific to Spain and not really used anywhere else. Um, and then I said sumo de China. Now, in most of the Spanish-speaking world, China is the country China. <laughs> but in Puerto Rico, it means orange. So, um, you could see how this one simple sentence, ¿Qué onda, May? No me gusta esta bebida. ¿Qué es esa vaina? ¿Vos podés traerme un vaso de sumo de China? <laughs> you can see how that might sound really bizarre if uh, you are a Spanish speaker or even if you've been learning Spanish for a while and someone was to speak to you in this way, um, you would probably get lost as well because there would be something in here that you would not know. So you can see with this silly example why it's important to pay attention to um, what you're learning, especially with vocabulary and not just vocabulary, right? Because we talked about words, but grammar. So vos podés, that's, that's grammar. There's many ways to say can you, right? Uh, but even uh, selecting the type of grammar you focus on is very much dependent on the type of Spanish you're learning. So again, that's a silly example. I hope you kind of get the point. Um, if that still doesn't sound weird to you in English, that would be like saying, uh, hey, mate, I don't want to get pop. I want a half and half and some candy floss. It's hella hot out here, right? Which that random sentence I just <laughs> put together. But, you know, mate is something that people say in Australia. Uh, pop is a way to refer to soda or carbonated beverages, but it's really just used in the Midwest of the United States. Where I'm from, we say soda. So pop would sound a little weird to me. 
Then I, I mentioned, you know, I want a half and half, which is very, very specific to one city uh, in the U.S. And it really means half iced tea, half lemonade. I think some people call it an Arnold Palmer after a golfer for some reason. Uh, but half and half anywhere else besides uh, where I'm from would mean half and half like cream, right? Cream and milk, I think, that you put in your in your coffee. Candy floss, and I didn't know this. I looked this one up. Uh, it actually means cotton candy in the UK. So here in the US, we would call it cotton candy. So if someone was to ask me for candy floss, I'd have no idea what they were talking about. Um, and then I said, it's hella hot out here. So like hella, again, it's like a, a very colloquial type of way of saying it's very hot, right? Um, and I've heard it used in California mainly, but I think it's spread to some other places, but uh, and it might even be more of a generational thing. Uh, but yeah, but these are all just very specific things. The only reason I bring up these silly examples is just to know that when you're a native English speaker and you're learning Spanish and you just ask, hey, what does that word mean? Now, someone will give you an answer. Uh, but if you start to use those words without this awareness of where they're coming from and what type of Spanish you're learning, you can sound very confused and very silly. And it might take you a while to figure out why someone doesn't understand you. And you might mistake that for, oh my God, my Spanish is really bad. I said this whole thing and no one understands me, but it might not be that your Spanish is bad. It might be who you're talking to. So not having that awareness can also be very demotivating because uh, it can get you in some situations where you get confused and then you might just give up, right? Oh, they didn't understand this. I practiced the sentence all, you know, all day <laughs> and they don't know what sumo de China is, right? Because it doesn't make any sense um, unless someone was from both Spain and Puerto Rico. Uh, but anyway, you, it can really be demotivating because you just don't have the awareness. So that's why I recommend to really uh, start uh, off with a type of Spanish. And the other reason why you need to be proactive about this is when you're talking to a native Spanish speaker, they may not even be aware that something they shared with you is specific to where they're from. Um, speaking for myself, you know, where I grew up, like I mentioned, half and half was something we all said. It wasn't until I left my city and went to ask for a half and half in another part of the country that I found out that everyone doesn't know that that's iced tea and lemonade. That's really just cream and milk. But it, I didn't know that for years. So if you would have asked me when I was much younger, I would have just told you that this is a half and half and it's a drink. And you, if you weren't a native speaker of English and you could have gone somewhere else and asked for a half and half and then just gotten confused, right? So even though you're talking to a native Spanish speaker and you feel that they're the authority, yes, they can tell you exactly what the words mean that they're using, but sometimes they don't even know that that word or phrase is specific to where they're from. Uh, if you're not talking to someone that has that level of awareness. So that's just something to also keep in mind. So you have some options. You could just fumble around and figure these things out when someone looks at you perplexed, <laughs> or you could be intentional about the type of Spanish you're learning. Okay. So I hope you are on board with me now and you really are excited about picking a type of Spanish to learn and that you can really see that this will help you focus and accelerate your path to Spanish fluency. So in part two of this conversation, the next episode, I'm going to get into what are the characteristics of a type of Spanish? What are the different features of a type of Spanish? And then I'll give you some guidance on how to pick which type of Spanish that you should be focusing your time and energy on as you are continuing to improve your Spanish proficiency. So I'll give you some uh, insight into that next week. We'll talk about the characteristics of a type of Spanish uh, in the next episode, how to pick a type of Spanish. And then once you have picked that type of Spanish, how you can begin to apply it right away to your Spanish learning time, right? Because none of us have an infinite amount of time, although I'm sure we would all love to. We only have a certain amount of time, certain number of hours in the day. And we want to know how to most effectively and best use that time as we are working on improving our Spanish. Okay, so I will give you all of uh, that in the next episode and part two of this conversation. Um, but for now, I hope that something you have heard today is taking you one step closer from being beginner to bilingual. And before I say adios, do not forget to leave us a rating and review in iTunes. We really do appreciate when we hear from our listeners uh, what you like about the show or what you would like to see more of. So make sure you click on the link. If you're listening to this in a podcast app, you can just 
uh, look into the description and there is a link that you can hit uh, that will open up our rating and review directly in iTunes so you don't have to go scrolling and searching for it. Uh, you can just click on that link in the description and leave us a rating and review. We really do appreciate it. Um, it'll only take you a minute uh, so we really do love to hear from you. And it also helps other people find the podcast. So if you're finding it useful, uh, go ahead and click on that link to leave us a rating and review. Uh, and of course, make sure you're subscribed so that you'll be the first to know when our next episode is available, which is going to be part two of our conversation on how to pick a type of Spanish to learn. So until the next time, hasta luego. Thank you for listening to the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast at LearnSpanishConSalsa.com.